Up next, we have Jim, and he is going to talk about some current trends on living off the land. And this is Phyllis Mauer. Let's give him a hand. Okay, just making sure the mic, one, one mic is off and the other one is on, because otherwise we're going to have some bad feedback. Um, my name is Jim Vandy, right? Uh, I've been doing the uh, cybersecurity or what you call information security for about 18 years. Um, different, uh, worked for customer, done reseller, done vendor, currently work for a vendor, so just as a heads up. This is very just informational about what's going on right now. Can you guys hear me okay? So, so? So, so. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so we'll go through, uh, this is the agenda, we'll just go through what typically traditional uh, malware was considered, and now what's called fileless malware. Um, fileless malware is kind of a BS industry term. Uh, it's literally, uh, I, for whatever reason, got tagged to be fileless malware uh, versus like once you're in an environment using tools that are already there, AKA living off the land, okay? So, but if you research it, you go to Dark Reading and you want to find out something about it or one of those other uh, websites with good info, fileless malware is what you want to look for, okay? Um, so we'll go through a little bit of history, um, some newer variants, um, talk about what the current trend is uh, for living off the land by attackers, and then kind of detecting some of it from the current tool set that you have uh, in your environment. So, of course, you got to do the, the traditional uh, Wikipedia definition here. Um, traditional malware, uh, for what most people think, would be have a executable uh, associated with it. Although, fileless malware goes back quite far. And then if you uh, were in Brian Satira's uh, talk before, he talked about PowerShell and going all the way back to using VBS uh, with the I love you virus. Um, I didn't quite go back that far in the history, but um, 2001, so a couple a year different. But fileless malware is literally usually defined by a few things. Okay, no files, duh. Uh, usually it does one of a few things. It exploits a vulnerability, and it's, that's what used to happen very frequently uh, with, uh, you know, uh, that's why IDS, IPS was born. And it might take advantage of a vulnerable uh, operating system or application, in fact, that maybe reside in memory, uh, and that's, quote, fileless, or plan itself in the registry uh, for persistence, perhaps. Again, quote, fileless. Um, so these kind of definitions are what make it, quote, fileless malware. If you guys have questions, please don't wait to the end. Just raise your hand. Okay. So... I did some research on this, actually, when I started here, here this company, uh, about six months ago, I was told I had to be, give a talk to 158 people at the North Texas ISSA. Uh, <laughs> and I had to come up with a subject that was relevant to what was happening in the industry today. Um, so I did some research, and I come across this dark reading article um, uh, published in December around fileless malware. I'm like, what is, fi I'm literally, what is fileless malware was my question. So I did a lot of research into it and dug into several sources and found out that there's a general consensus of between 50 and 60% of all malware in 2017. And the key pieces there is that the second half of the year uh, was really when it took off. And the only reason that fileless malware, quote, fileless malware exists or living off the land is to uh, evade detection. So once you do get into an environment, rather than downloading something that has an IOC hash match or a command and control domain or URL that your current controls can catch or that you can de detonate in a malware sandbox or whatever it might be, it's just another way to get around current controls. Um, the key piece about that is, is there's not a whole lot of IOCs that are left behind if you ever use PowerShell or used uh, Windows Management Instrumentation, Command Line, nothing really is left behind to find unless you are watching it during it happening. Um, so we'll dig into a little bit of this. This is the very, very abridged history of uh, fileless malware. Um, so who can tell me uh, why Code Red back in 2001 is called Code Red? Just 
Yep. Yeah, there, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, it was a company called EI Partners back in the day. Uh, that was threat, like did a lot of uh, antivirus de decompilation and uh, investigation on vi viral what was happening in the uh, virus space, uh, the vulnerability exploitation space, that kind of thing. And they actually named it this because they were drinking Code Red. Anyway, <laughs> it's one of the uh, farthest back uh, ones in. Uh, Brian Satira did bring up I, the I Love You virus, which was VBS in 2000. Uh, this, about that same time, uh, there were a lot more scripting uh, things that took advantage of a vulnerability, not necessarily came in an email, although I Love You was one of the first ones. Uh, with that said, uh, Code Red uh, was an interesting thing because it was one of the first real uh, worms out there that got loose. What it would do is it would take advantage of an, a vulnerable IIS server, and back then, they weren't behind a firewall oftentimes, right on the internet, uh, without much protection. And they would take advantage of that vulnerability, and it would create uh, 99 threads to exploit additional IP addresses on the internet, so to spread itself to wherever it could find on the internet, and then it would deface the web page. Boy, if we could just go back to those days when all you had to worry about was web face to page, uh, web face, uh, web page defacement. Uh, um, I don't know if you guys remember back in the day when uh, this this was one of the web face, uh, the web page defacements was AirTran. AirTran had a plane go down, and they with this uh, somebody defaced their website, and it's kind of I guess the, the hacker humor at the time had the plane going down in flames and people on fire falling out of the plane. So they tried to you know, kill the brand or whatever it might be. Um, SQL Slammer was a unique one. I, I remember back in the day, this one was almost impossible to stop. Um, was a concept at Black Hat uh, for a buffer overflow um, in Microsoft SQL. Uh, and actually, somebody used it and did something with it. Um, the unique part about it was is it was a one packet UDP attack. And there's nothing, I don't think today, even still, how are you gonna stop that? There's no session, even an IDS, IPS, one packet goes right by it. Um, so it was very difficult to stop. Um, but the fact up here that I got off the internet it said 75,000 machines in 10 minutes, but it was actually every single machine that was vulnerable on the internet happened in under 11 minutes. Um, so very fast spreading worm. So some of the fast, faster spreading pieces. Now we're gonna fast forward because other, otherwise we'll be here all day. Um, <laughs> so Palix is uh, a more modern, uh, still not really the, the, the most modern, but more modern type of quote, fileless malware. Um, this one did uh, use a vulnerability, and you'll notice as we get newer and newer, they're not using vulnerabilities to, to get into the organization. Uh, they're using more, more along the lines of phishing emails and that type of thing to get in the organization. But this one did uh, exploit a remote uh, privilege escalation vulnerability. Um, and it, the cool part about it was, uh, for the first time, it used uh, unreadable Unicode characters in the registry. So. While the registry could interpret it, the humans could not, and so it was a good way to hide itself. Um, also, if you, anytime you double clicked on a folder, open a folder, it would, uh, that was just one of its persistence mechanisms, and it also had a watchdog. Um, stuff that typical malware does today, um, but this is one of the ones in the quote, fileless realm, AKA registry entries, um, that was, what, this is one of the first ones that did that. You guys have probably seen this before. Uh, before ransomware, there were screen lockers. <laughs> uh, so Copter, Copter started out as a screen locker and quote scareware um, to try and get people to give, you know, enter some sort of money, uh, much like ransomware, to unlock your screen. Um, Copter has evolved. Uh, it started out as a pretty uh, normal. This is almost all it did. Copter has actually really been used more recently in uh, ransomware, and there's a lot of updates uh, that it's posing as updates for uh, Chrome, Firefox, uh, whatever it might be. And for a while, it was used for malvertising. It's a pretty flexible piece of, quote, fileless soft uh, malware out there. Um, it's still around today as ransomware.
And then let's uh, fast forward to 2017. Um, some of this was starting to be developed in 2016. And th this is being used pretty extensively. You'll notice one thing about every single one of these. Um, it, find one word that's the same in all four of these. That's right, living off the land. What, what is in the environment? So um, another piece is, is, is there's another word in three of them. Yeah, macro, evil macro. <laughs> well, you know, the idea here is that when you, you uh, have a macro, the compiled uh, hash still looks like the uh, Word or Excel or whatever it is, but the macro can contain some bad code in it and be launched. Um, so usually what these do is they come in as a ma in the side of a macro, they launch PowerShell into memory, and then they do their dirty work. And usually they get in by a phishing attack. Um, one of the uh, interesting ones, uh, Powerware, is a, a really uh, unique way to use PowerShell to encrypt the entire system for, quote, ransomware. Uh, this is not one usually used to uh, encrypt and then ask for money. It's usually used to encrypt and make it forensically inaccessible. Uh, because it is a script um, that's downloaded to encrypt the machine, uh, Powerware it is. Um, as a result, uh, you know, usually there isn't anything left to pop up anything on the screen or send you an email or whatever to tell you that they're, to give me, to give me money to unencrypt your machine. August was a unique one, and this is, uh, you know, they're always trying to obfuscate uh, the data, whether it's Base64 encoding used on the PowerShell, uh, with PowerShell, or XOR encoding, or whatever it might be, or compression, uh, used a PowerShell byte array, uh, which PowerShell interprets just fine. Everything's good there. But if you've ever looked at a byte array, to deobfuscate that takes some considerable time to find out what the real command was. So that was pretty unique. Uh, Posh Spy, uh, which uh, also, if you did go to uh, uh, Brian, uh, what was it, Satira? Satira. Yeah, session. he also talked about Posh Spy. One of the unique things about this one is it started using WMI. Uh, we didn't see this a whole lot, uh, just because PowerShell is, more, is really ubiquitous in almost all Windows environments, back to what, I think it's Windows Server 2003, I think it is. Um, so that was, that's what still is most commonly used with fileless malware. Um, but WMI is starting to pop up a lot more. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Any questions so far? Okay. We'll go over why PowerShell is currently the tool of choice for living off the land, like we talked about. It's everywhere. Um, it's generally trusted because it's used by sysadmins to get the job done. Uh, another one is, is that uh, it's easy to downgrade. Nobody's watching a downgrade of PowerShell. Uh, version 3 and version 5 both have auditing capabilities. And you can go get, download, there's a couple of uh, guides to turn on, on auditing to be able to audit for bad stuff happening in PowerShell. But if the attacker downgrades it to version 2, it wipes out auditing completely. And that's usually one of the first things they'll do if they find version 3 or 5. Now you can monitor the system to watch for the downgrade. That's another thing you might want to do, okay? Um, it's also stealthy. Uh, it can load a couple of different ways. Load directly into memory, as we talked about. Another piece is, is the system automation DLL, um, which is commonly used in environments, does not even show up in task manager. It doesn't show up as a service. So when it does load into memory, even if you did a process listing, it's not there. and it's you know, this is, these are normal tools that your sysadmins use, okay? This is not the bad guys doing anything awful. It's just they're using what exists in the environment. Um, like we talked about, doesn't leave many artifacts behind. Um, is encrypted between machines. That's another uh, piece. And let me go ahead and through here real quick. Often obfuscated in some way as a script. It can be a C script, W script, um, lots of different ways you can get PowerShell to do your bidding. <laughs> um, if you use an application whitelisting tool, um, you, you know, there's not a whole lot of granularity PowerShell runs or doesn't. And I'm not a genius in application whitelisting uh, tools, so there might be some granularity in some products out there or uh, solutions. 
Um, then the key piece is, is just to avoid current controls. If you think about it, if I uh, send a phishing email in, it's embedded in a macro, I dump it into memory, um, uh, you know, that's obviously security awareness training that failed. Somebody double clicked on the macro, enabled it, dumped it into memory. The key piece there is everything that PowerShell does at the command line is text. It's not downloading any executables that would normally be an I IOC pickup from traditional AV, maybe IDS, IPS, maybe the firewall, um, whatever it is, even in a malware sandbox, what are you gonna detonate in a the sandbox? There's no executable, it's text. You know, so it isn't really something that is, it's meant to avoid current controls. Um, and it's often overlooked, um, you know, because sysadmins, it's been the reign of sysadmins forever, and it does a great job getting the operations part of the comp organization's uh, work done. Um, and then the key piece here, too, is another one, which is, again, this is where I'm showing you all stuff that we've built to help us including these uh, entire PowerShell frameworks, and there's more out there. But red teams have created these, and for good. I mean, a lot of these, okay, I'm a field engineer. I am not a reverser of malware. I can load up PS attack, and it's just a menuing system. Man, I, I mean, if I can uh, do this, anybody can, okay? <laughs> I mean, power Splayed, uh, PowerShell Empire, they're all super easy to use. Um, and so the bad guys, of course, you know, it's easy to use, why not use that too? Um, so why is it so popular now? Uh, it's just because it avoids current controls. It avoids the risk of being caught. The attacker doesn't want to be caught, so it doesn't generate IOCs generally. It doesn't need IOCs to install or get there or do, do much of anything. Um, it's usually really flexible. Uh, allows you to do many different things in the environment. So. If one thing you do fails, so what? Go to back to the playbook, do another one, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. I'm not leaving any artifacts behind. I'm not downloading executables. I'm just trying new things that probably will go unnoticed if auditing isn't turned on or you don't have something monitoring it. Um, so let's talk about detecting fileless malware. Um, so there's some basics. Um, usually it's pretty abnormal for PowerShell to run out of the temp directory or anything of that nature. Um, this does happen fairly normally. Uh, download and execute string. So download string and execute. But usually they, it, with, with sysadmins, when they do it, they might download it, but it takes a little while for them to execute. If it's a bad guy, it's almost download string and almost immediate execute if they do download something that is file-based. Um, Oftentimes there is obfuscation, base64, XORing, uh, compression, something of that nature. Um, and oftentimes if you, if you don't have, you don't normally use C script or W script, uh, et cetera, any kind of scripting language for PowerShell, you can talk to your sysadmins about this. That's probably not your sysadmins doing it, okay? So that's just another way to catch that. Um, if they are using the PowerShell automation DLL um, normally, thank you so much for the 10 minute warning. <laughs> it's almost beer, beer o'clock. Um, so, <laughs> and I, I know you, I'm standing between you guys and beer, so we only got a few more uh, slides here. <laughs> um, if they are using the PowerShell automation DLL, uh, sysadmins are, um, you can ask them A, not to use it, or B, um, you use it under certain circumstances, okay? Since it does not show up, loads in memory, does not show up in task manager, does not show up in the process listing. Uh, you can also watch for persistence. Um, if, it, yeah, if a PowerShell script is using MSHTA or HTA, that is not your sysadmin. I can tell you that right now. That is highly, highly, highly unlikely. Um, if they're using invoked expressions, like for a framework, for Metasploit, not, probably not your sysadmin, okay? Um, using JavaScript engines, probably not your sysadmin doing, for, uh, these are persistence mechanisms a lot of time. Okay, so we're almost done here. Um, it's interesting, those 56% uh, on average, okay, I did a lot of research on the web, so I just took a bunch of articles and some were, 48%, somewhere 60 some odd percent, somewhere 50%. 
And I came up with 56% from multiple sources in 2017. And 2018 so far, it's 60%, which doesn't seem like a huge increase uh, over file-based malware, but it's actually just shifting the playing field. So PowerShell was all the rage in 2017 and 2018, and I think that's why we had the advent of the MITRE attack framework two Februarys ago, uh, so 16-ish months ago, was around you know living off the land, what people were doing internally once they do get in. And we've seen a lot of uptick, and you can Google this, it's all out there, it's all research I just did on the internet. WMI, or Windows Management Instrumentation, seems to be the big one now, because you guys are getting smarter, you're turning on auditing for PowerShell in version three and five, you're monitoring if it's being downgraded, you're working with your sysadmins about WScript, CScript, you know, you're getting smarter. And so to evade detection, they're just moving to another powerful tool in your environment to get the job done. Um, and, you know, who knows what's next? Uh, maybe it's an old Netcat, maybe it's, you know, other things that reside on Windows that they're gonna start using. But the idea here is, is that this is a problem now, it's a current trend, I mean, and it's not gone away. So it's just something to be aware of. This is an awareness type thing. So that's it. Any questions? Yeah. So in your presentation, your, your focus is pretty much on IOC. And I noticed that was the last one too. But you mentioned the infection vector for the PowerShell activity. Most of the time it's coming through a phishing type of email. Correct. So did you have to look at uh, preventing as along as looking at that process tree. So something comes into an email. Um, Word doc kicks off the script or whatever. Yep. Uh, you should see that activity to stop that activity at that point. And then yeah. you're preventing that from happening. Yeah, if you're looking at like uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTPs, I mean, you have something to do that. This is an easily, these are much more easily stoppable, okay? Uh, since they don't generate really any artifacts, that is why IOCs are not not useless necessarily, but just less, much less use, useful than normal. So you're right. Because normally when you're getting into the IOC part, most of the time it's too late. Bingo. Exactly. It's a, it, I mean, really catching uh, people living off the land is all about tactics, techniques, and procedures generally monitoring that and being able to, you know, catch them doing it when they're doing it, generally. Yes, sir. So Microsoft has been trying to deal with things like the HTA abuse yep. with the current versions of PowerShell. Um, are they planning to do anything around the PowerShell, like, you know, going down to the lower version, having that be noisy or perhaps implementing without some other, you know, some other means of us being able to detect it? So sure. that's kind of quiet. Yeah, there are some sys monitoring tools that you, from Microsoft um, that, and there are third-party ones too that you can, you know, use in your environment, literally just to monitor version changes. I will tell you that I've seen a couple customers do this, and this is not a problem. It's just sometimes sys admins they don't want to uh, modify their scripts, so they will actually downgrade ver from version three or five to version two to get it to run, and then uh, maybe upgrade it again. So if you see that, well, I'm, where I'm going with this is we are, we're all up, you know. Yeah, it's it's just something to be aware of, but there are some uh, monitoring tools you can use to do that today. So it's another way of just, you know, keeping an eye on things. What's going on in my environment? Awareness. Yes, sir. Have, have you seen, so a lot of the detections for PowerShell are based off of Office Scaling? Um, uh, correct. correct. So have you seen any shift where or actors are not obfuscating their, their commands to evade? Uh, well, yes and no. Um, the, the, the whole reason obfuscation is used logically is to evade detection of any kind of monitoring or auditing tool. Um, so if you use turn auditing on version three or five, you can monitor for obfuscation, which usually your sysadmins don't use. Um, Yes, you could, but the auditing would pick that up probably if you configure auditing correctly uh, via some guides on the internet. Uh, meaning like, okay, it does, it does download string and execute in like one second. That's pretty unusual for an sysadmin to do. 
or you know a couple other things there, using utilizing MSHTA or HTA, you know those kind of things in audit. So, but no, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, the reason I'm Heck yeah. Because uh, you know you see a lot of things progress uh, technically, and then you, you yeah. go low tech. Yep. Because everybody's looking for the you know obfuscation. This one. Or you use is is a uh, allure. Yeah, you on that's quote unobfuscated section of the stuff is a lure thinking you've got them, and then there might be something else that's a reference later that is actually the bad part. Yep, I agree. No, you're right. I mean, it's a cyclical pattern; it seems to go up and down. All right, it's beer o'clock, people. <laughs> Thanks for your time.